going as far as uh, find him? Uh -huh. You don't waste much time, do you? Robbie? Who's that? Mark, you idiot. You in the bedroom or the head? Vulgar word, that. Head. I can't just say dyke like everyone else. But you're early. Five o'clock, you said. It's only a quarter past three. Yeah, I thought I'd surprise you. You surprised me, all right. You caught me with my pants down, literally. I wish you'd come when you say you're coming. Look, um, what's wrong? You a bit frazzled or something? What? Come on, man. You just seem a bit edgy, that's all. I'm sorry. You know me. I don't really mind this contraption as long as I can kid people into not wondering how I manage the dike. The dike is the thing that really bugs me. It is so... <laughs> Forget it. Good trip down? Deadly. Pouring rain the last few miles. And this terrible hitchhiking bird. You picked up a bird? <laughs> a raging nympho. But you're always going on about hitchhikers and what a cheek they have, expecting strangers to transport them for free. You also leave doors open. Yeah, I know, but this one was lying in the road in the pouring bloody rain. I thought, Christ, hit and run job or something. So I pulled up. Before I could open the door to look, she hopped in. Uh -huh. She said, it always worked, and please would I take her to Kyneton. 
Apparently she, uh, she had to meet her auntie at the post office or something. A chance like that, I'm surprised you're early. <laughs> Not my type. I never went in for blondes much. I notice you don't talk about sex much nowadays. No. Neither would you if you were at sea. Nobody talks about anything else. Well, that's not the real reason, is it? What are you getting at? Look, stop being diplomatic. I'm not being diplomatic. Oh, I forget. Don't suppose I'd talk about sex much either if things were the uh, other way around. If you were the eunuch and not me. Get a cup of tea. But I brought some whiskey with me. No, no, sit down. Sit down and talk to me. Well, it's only out in the car. Well, leave it there. You've bought me enough already. Balls. <laughs> Them, unfortunately, you can't buy. But you've bought everything else. Car, television, this piss-elegant wheelchair and this bloody great mansion. It's your money just as much as mine, you know. Not strictly true. The old man left it to you. So what? I'm not complaining. Very sensible. He didn't want $80,000 frittered away on a second lot of death duties. What death duties? The old man knew that I would die before you, about 40 years before. Crap, Robbie. Don't crap me. I know it, you know it, and the old man knew it. It's just a question of what packs up first. Most likely it'll be my kidneys, the paraplegic's occupational disease. We should talk about something else. What's the matter? Don't you like talking about death? Bullseye. Not bad. One in five, it's bloody terrible. Now stand clear. I wouldn't insult you. Do what you're told. Nowadays, my neck gets a bit stiff and my aim can be hairy. What would people think if I killed you? See what I mean? You gave me quite a scare, then. Doesn't feel right shooting from here. I suppose I should go to Kyneton and practice properly. Why don't you go, then? I leave you here. You've only just arrived. Well, uh, I could come with you. Forget it. Look, you want to practice, don't you? But you don't want me to come with you. Would you believe me if I said you put me off? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd have to, wouldn't I? Okay, I'll put your things in the car. No! Now, I do everything for myself, Mark, if you know that. Just try and be sociable. I'm sorry I snapped. Just that if I let anyone help with anything, I'll end up letting them do the lot. Maybe you're doing too much. Is yours? A Fenebus. No, Mark, if I did any less than I'm doing now, I'd throw it in. What do you mean? I'd take those Fenebus. That'd be stupid. I'm the one who has to live my life, you know. Not if you end it. If it stops being interesting, why prolong it? Well, if I'm going, I'd better go. I'll see you at six. Ah. See you at six. See you.
Marty. So, you're back. Long time no see. It's only been 12 weeks. I've been thinking about you. Quite a lot, actually. What are you doing tonight? Oh, nothing I can't put off. Am I going to be able to see you there, or are you still afraid of what Big Brother might think? Look, it, it's not that. It's just that I don't want Robbie to know, that's all. I'll see you tonight. Hey, look, aren't we just a little bit too old to still be necking in the back of a car? I'll pick you up at your place. What time? Nine-ish. I'll see you. Bye.
Excellent. You'd have taken the Australian record this year if you hadn't buggered your neck. <laughs> Weren't you expecting your brother down this week? I left him at home. Not very hospitable of me, eh? Well, he's a big boy now. Tried to phone him about an hour ago, but the line must have been out of order. Uh-oh, look who's coming. Uh, no, Charlie, it's your job to stay here and protect me. You protect yourself. If necessary, shoot him. Afternoon. Robert, how lovely to see you. Mrs. Lipton, Mr. Lipton. My dear chap. You must come to dinner and christen our new pool. What are you doing tonight? I've got my brother staying with me. Bring him along. We've always wanted to meet him. Bring him now and ask him. Two stalls, thanks. It's already begun. Yes, that's all right. Any way you like. Father. What you tell him? Tell him you're being in the What do you reckon I did? I haven't seen you for weeks. I've got to get out of town. <laughs> you wouldn't get round the block. You've had it, mate. This is a transcript of your confession. Have you read it? Yes. Do you find this a true and accurate account of what you said? Yes. Are you willing to sign this confession of your own free will? Yes. All right, Sergeant. Witness this signature. Morning, sir. Morning, Constable. Prisoner from the City Watch House, sir. Prisoner's paper, sir. Thank you, Constable. Name? Richard Francis Taylor. You are now a prisoner of Her Majesty, and from now on you will address all prison officers as sir. Name? Richard Francis Taylor. Sir. Sentence? Twenty years, sir. Crime? Murder, sir. Take the cuffs off, Constable. Sir? You are no longer Richard Francis Taylor. You are now number 8497. As you were, 8498. Got it? Yeah. Yes, what? Yes, sir. And don't bloody forget it. 
No. Sir. All right. Empty your pockets. Have you ever been in prison before? No, sir. It's one rule here, son. You do the right thing by us, and we'll do the right thing by you. Got it? Shh. Sir. If you do the wrong thing, boy, I'll get jumped on. And if I get jumped on, I'll jump on you. Understand? Yes, sir. One handkerchief, white soil. When was the last time you had your hair cut, 8498? Before I went into court, sir. It's too long. We'll fix that tomorrow. Let's get your particulars. Religion? I see, sir. Don't get smart with me, boy. Do you mean Roman Catholic? Yes, sir. Hair blonde. Fair hair, sir. Eyes grey. Green eyes, sir. Do you wear corrective spectacles or contact lenses? No, sir. False teeth, false limbs, hearing aid or surgical truss? No, sir. One brown leather wallet, $12 in notes, driving license and laundry docket. Are you receiving medical treatment for any serious illness or disability? No, sir. Key ring, four keys, small change, 87 cents. Have you ever suffered from mental illness or undergone psychiatric treatment? No, sir. One packet of chewing gum. Have you ever had any attacks of fainting or dizziness? Sir. One packet of cigarettes and matches. Are you an epileptic? line must be out of order. He's not answering. I'm afraid we'll have to postpone that dinner. That's what you always say. <laughs> uh, what is the time? Exactly half past five. Oh, my God, I'm late. I'll have to rush. Uh, thank you for asking me. Said the one. 
Little brother, what on earth have you been up to? What? I said, what on earth have you been up to? The place stinks of perfume. And petrol. Oh, that. Yeah, I, I spilled some aftershave. I tried to rub it off with lighter fluid. Well, you've made a nasty clean patch. Surprised you can smell it, though. I can't. I have a nose like a bloodhound. Have you been out? The engine's been playing up, so I thought I'd take her out for a spin. Worse, if anything, though. So I thought the hell with it. Why? Oh, I don't know. Does everyone have to have a reason for everything? You always do. Well, it's time I didn't. Perhaps I just felt like a snooze. This is the world price of oil. The organization of petroleum exporting countries, in a statement issued after their meeting yesterday in Cairo, announced a rise of 25%. The rise, the third in 12 months. Do we have to have that on? January the 1st next year. The statement I want to watch the news. further rises to follow later in the year. Now, here's a late story just in. We've just been advised by the police of the murder of yet another hitchhiker. The body of 23-year-old Janine Talbot of Middle Park was found less than an hour ago in the back stalls of the Rex Cinema, Kyneton. We have a news team on the spot, and we hope to be able to cross direct for their report later in this news. Sarge. Do you want any more shots of the body, Inspector? Give me another one from that angle. I want to see the wound. Right. Same pattern. Stabbed under the breastbone and through the heart. Neat job. No trace of the murder weapon. Is that all we think? That'll do. Those prints on the backrest hopeful? They're pretty old, Inspector. Come on, Sergeant. Have to deal with those vultures outside. This is Inspector Cheadle, who is leading the investigation into the Marunda Maniac case. Tell me, Inspector, do you think this is the work of the Marunda Maniac? I'm afraid so. It's more than just over a year. The victim is always a blonde in her early 20s. And do you think this one's been sexually assaulted? None of them ever are. The first three girls were picked up on the Marinda Highway, killed within an hour or so, and then, for some inexplicable reason, deposited on the steps of the local police station. And why do you think this time it was the cinema and not the police station? I rather think this one didn't go quite according to plan. This time, we do have a positive lead. Sergeant, have you got that description? Yes. It's a well-built young man, about 5'10", long, fair hair, dark glasses, dressed hippie style in t-shirt, jeans and tennis shoes, seen entering the Rex Cinema Kyneton this afternoon at about 4.30. And is there anything you'd like to add, Inspector? I'd like to impress on the public this man is dangerous. If anyone suspects his identity or is foolhardy enough to be protecting him, I strongly advise them to contact the police immediately. That report direct from our news team on the spot in Kyneton. And now, finally, the weather, and there's more rain on the way. Why would anyone want to protect him? Wouldn't you protect me? If I knew that you were this maniac? It's a hypothetical question, little brother, and the hypothesis is absurd. Even if you did... Did what? Like a drink? Did what, Robbie? Nothing. Robbie did what? 
Tell me that you picked up a blonde nympho and that the last ten miles were... dead. You know, you had me worried. For a minute there, I thought you might actually suspect me. You, a murderer? <laughs> Did anyone see you? See me what? Picking up the blonde nympho. No. Sure? Yeah. Good. Anyone see you put her down? Well, yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. It was in front of the post office. I shouldn't think anyone noticed, though. I mean, people don't, do they? I'm thirsty. Is that scotch still on offer? Yeah, if you want it. I want it. Come on, get it. JMB, duty free from Singapore. Uh, just a small one. Is this? Perfect. Cheers. Feel like going to the fix tonight? Anything good on locally? Only a day of horror at the Ritz. I've seen it. Really? When? Last voyage. Back to it. Rex is the only cinema I can get the chair into. We'll go to Day of Horror if you really want to. Sure you don't mind? Oh, why should I? It's a good movie. Besides, I missed most of it last time. Preoccupied with the bird beside you? So sorry. Are you blind? Just crippled, how about you? I'm a police officer heading an investigation into a murder, if you don't mind. Well, good for you. What time does the film start? This cinema, sir, is closed. You seem to persist in your assumption that because I'm in a wheelchair, I am blind. I'm aware that the cinema is closed. What I want to know is when will it reopen? I have no idea. In that case, Constable, could you take me to someone who does? Sergeant! You will give your name and address to my sergeant, and then you will move along. 
Well, I don't particularly care, though I'd prefer to be in a state. But you will move along, or I'll have you arrested for obstructing the police and the prosecution of their duties. <laughs> is that what this fiasco is supposed to be? Your name and address, sir! Raymond Burr, late of Hollywood. Robbie, uh, give it to them. Robert Stephen Gifford. The wheel in. Wheel? W H double E L I double N. Wheel in? It's, uh, it's a joke. Not at all. It's very serious and most apt. Wheel in where, sir? Foster's Lager Lane. You go down the road three miles and you turn left at the Chuck and Chanda. And then right just before St. Brassies. You can't miss it. Kyneton? And thereabouts. I'll pick you up round the back. Good night, Mr. Streetle. Good night. Good night, gentlemen. Hmm. Did you notice that smell? Smell? Perfume. On the cripple? No. On the other one. You think I went too far, don't you? Too far? With a copper. Well, I don't think you exactly endeared yourself. Should I have? Uh, that's your business. Only? I see who that is, Vince. Uh, you, you made your point clear that you don't exactly like coppers. Do you have to go rubbing their noses in? Raymond Burr, for Christ's sake. <laughs> May we come in? Oh, my God, they've come for me already. Good evening, sir. I trust you found my directions helpful? Well, actually, I think my sergeant must have misheard you. Can he hear? Oh, yes, sir. Inspector, from behind, I detest being gawped at. To my face, I find it intolerable. I'm sorry. Well, whatever it is I'm supposed to have done, I'm pleading blackouts and the Fifth Amendment. Or does that only work in the United States? Well, actually, it's nothing you've done I've come about. On the contrary, it's something I did. I'm afraid I was rather rude to you. I cried all the way home. Poor Mr. Gifford. I can only say in my defense, I just rushed down from Russell Street. The press were driving me mad. When I realized we were passing this way and your lights were on... You felt you simply had to drop in. That's right. And I need your help. May we sit down? As someone who knows the disabled in this area, how would you class a person who allows her wheelchair to be pushed? A paraplegic? Yes. Pushed uphill? No, downhill. Definitely not doing very well. Who is she? Well, that's what I came to ask you. From around here, you say? Yes. No such person. Well, such a person was seen being wheeled into the wrecks by her long-haired boyfriend. 
I don't care if she was seen being wheeled into Parliament House by Gough Whitlam. There is no such person. Her boyfriend, or possibly her brother, dresses hippie style. He's in his mid-twenties and is wanted by you. Yes, we saw the whole thing on television. Ah, that explains how your brother knew my name when we had our little altercation at the Rex. You heard my appeal on the news, did you, sir? Yes. You must have a good memory for names. Or has this marooned maniac chap caught your fancy? I was uh, hardly aware of him till today. Really? The story's been reported in all the newspapers. Well, I, I don't buy newspapers. I'm a seaman. Oh. Navy or merchant? Merchant. At sea, we get uh, daily bulletins, uh, who's on strike, who's at war, currency crises, but no murders. And ashore, I've got out of the habit. Of murdering? Of buying newspapers. Just one more thing. If the cinema had been open this evening and you and your brother had seen the film, how would you personally have left the Rex? By the side exit. You see, the aisle to the side door slopes downwards, which we paraplegics prefer. Mm hmm. And uh, how would you have left, sir? Through the foyer. That's the quickest way around to the car. Well, I think that explains that, don't you, Sergeant? Explains what, Inspector? Why no one front of house noticed the girl being wheeled out of the wrecks by her boyfriend, and why the usher had swears she saw a girl wearing a floppy hat wheel herself out the side exit unaccompanied. Of course, I was hoping you were going to be able to identify the girl or a boyfriend. And what good would that have done you? Well, they sat at the end of one of the back rows. Twenty minutes later, they left. When the film ended, the lights came up. Janine Talbot was found dead at the end of that row. We think they must have seen her murderer. They left before the film ended? Having ended after it started. Sounds like one hell of a film. I thought you said it was good, what you'd seen of it. You've seen part of this film already, sir? Uh, yes, on the Canberra, last voyage. I had to go on duty before it finished, though. Uh, the film, that is, not the voyage. Well, thank you for your cooperation, gentlemen. You've been most helpful. I am sorry to hear that. Good night, Mr. Gibbons. Mr. Gibbard, Inspector. It's been nice talking to you, Sergeant. Why can't Cheadle see it? It is so obvious. What? It wasn't the girl wheeling herself out of the cinema. It was her boyfriend. He ditched her body in the back row and then stuck her hat on his head. You've got to admire him for it, really, though, don't you? Showed a lot of guts. And he'll get away with it. Well, he may. Unless you enlighten the police. Am I likely to? Or don't you think you should? No. No, I don't. So you'd be holding your tongue? Certainly. Do you want him to get away with it? Recently exposed. No, we've no ex inmates answering that description. Well, there are thousands of bad features in Melbourne. Most of them victims of car accidents. Really? Well, except for a few freak cases like Robbie's. Robert Gifford? What happened to him? He was playing squash, would you believe? Slipped and fell. Other round? Yes, thanks. Same again, please. 
And that was enough to paralyze him? Well, that on top of an old back injury he had as a kid. He was what the courts call a neglected child. Well, that's how he came to get adopted by Mark's father. So he and Mark aren't really brothers. No, but they're very close. They do anything for each other. What's wrong with you? Nothing. I just don't feel like it tonight, that's all. Terrific. Three months and I can't even touch you. Look, it's not that. It's just that I'm... I just need to talk. This may not strike you as odd, but a 24-year-old woman needs a bit more than a stray screw in the back of a car every three months. Look, Mick, can you at least just try and understand? Maybe that's normal for sailors on leave. Listen, Margaret, will you, for Christ's sake, just cut it out? You know the problem. I do not know the problem. Yes, you do. Would never have lasted accident or no accident, you know that. Yeah. But Robbie doesn't. Mark, what is this hold Robbie has over you? He's my brother. Some brother. Look, he has to know sometime. Why can't you tell him? I can't. All right. I will. Yes. That was it. Just a minute. I'm sorry. Who is it? Uh, Richard Fairburn. Oh, hi, Doc. What can I do for you? How's your neck? Uh, uh, you sure? Of course I am. Now, what made you think? Just, uh, checking. Now, come on. Some of your thicker patients might believe that, but not me. Mark brought you up to it, didn't he? He did not. He's with you now, isn't he? Uh, he, uh, he, he telephoned me. Well, that's more like it. Uh, Mark tells me you're complaining of, uh, stiffness of the neck. Uh, says you told him it's, uh, affecting your shooting. Now, he suggests, and I'm inclined to agree with him, that you should come back to the hospital for a rest and a checkup. Quite unnecessary. I've never felt fitter. Robbie, you've got lesions. I know I've got lesions. I, I, I still can't imagine how anyone as, as experienced as you could have been uh, uh, mad enough to lift a television set off the table onto my lap. I know it won't happen again. Now, is there anything else? I've got housework to do. Nothing else, Robbie. Goodbye.
They're closed. Margaret. I'm sorry, I have to close up. I want to talk to Look, you. Look, Mark, there's nothing I have to say to you. Just go. You are an irresponsible bitch. Why don't you like bitch? You ring up Robbie and arrange it all behind my back. What the hell do you think you're playing at? Well, he is my cousin, you know. Not a blood cousin, but he's... Look, just because he can't walk doesn't mean you have to treat him like an infant. He's a lot stronger than you think. Don't you tell me what Robbie's like. Well, I think I have a fair idea. I'm not talking about his performance in bed. No. Then what do you mean? Look, I know Robbie. He can face the thought of being replaced by you. And what makes you think you're any judge of that, hmm? I'm probably the best judge there is. Listen. If you tell him there's anything between us, I promise you, you will regret it. Quadriplegic? Uh, one who's um, lost the use of four limbs, uh, compared with the... Uh, the paraplegic has lost use of only two. Did you know it's coming? Oh, yes, yes. Before his accident, Robbie was a medical student, you know. Hmm. How soon will it come? Any time in the next few months. Most likely at night. He'll just wake up one night and uh, he'll find he can't move a thing. And then? Might be a year. And it all stems from those lesions? Uh, that's right, yes. Has Mark told you anything of his plans when it happens? He says he'll, uh, he'll give up the sea and uh, live with his brother. What sort of a life will that be? Hell for Mark. Worse for Robbie. I'm surprised he doesn't kill himself. Just be a head on top of a corpse. Some manage marvelously. Good afternoon, Inspector. Good afternoon. Inspector. Thank you. Take a seat. Thank you. Been cleaning your carpet, Mr. Gifford. Oh, uh, I spilled some aftershave. On yourself as well, I think. My sergeant noticed it on you yesterday. When exactly did you spill it? Um, yesterday afternoon, just after I got here. I'd say about 3.30. And what sort of lotion was it? Brutes. Don't tell me you're thinking about buying some. My sergeant took a fancy to it, didn't you, sergeant? Well, it takes all kinds. Did you hear that, Mark? The sergeant's kinky for brute. Why don't you give him what's left of yours? There isn't any left. Have you still got the bottle? No, I threw it away. Where were you between 4.30 and 6 p.m. yesterday afternoon? I was having a sleep. I left him on that sofa at half past three. I later woke him twice. From the hospital? By telephone. At half past four and again at half past five. Might I ask what prompted these calls? You may. The first was to suggest that he join me at the hospital. Because, as I pointed out to our chief physiotherapist, I felt guilty about leaving him alone. The second was to inquire whether he would agree to dine with a very boring couple called the Liptons. 
That would be Mr. and Mrs. Stanley Lipton, would it? Oh, God, don't tell me she's your sister. She's at least a thousand. No, she's not my sister. Your daughter? No. Mr. and Mrs. Lipton live on the Marundo Highway. We questioned them at the time of the third girl's murder. I've been obstreperous, haven't I? On the contrary. You've told us a great deal. And now, Mr. Gifford, I wonder if you can recall seeing anyone being picked up on the following dates. No. Let's see. Uh, the afternoon of August the 4th last year. The evenings of April the 29th and July the 10th of this year. Oh, yesterday afternoon, about 2.30. Well, I didn't see anyone picked up yesterday. Uh, must be the other dates. I can't even remember which part of the world I was in. You were on leave. Your ship was in Melbourne, and you were in this part of the world. We've checked with the piano. Then I may well have been on my way down here, but I couldn't honestly say. Is it important? It could be helpful. Easily find out. What date last year did you say? August the 4th. April the 29th. July the 10th. On each of those days, a dead girl was dumped outside the Kyneton police station. Mark, on each of those days, you were on your way down here. Did you see anyone picking up anyone else? May I see those diaries? I see that on all these nights, you left here almost as soon as you arrived to visit the cousins, as your brother describes them. Yes. As I uh, often drop in on them. I believe there's two of them. That's right. What are their names? Andrew and Margaret. Have you, forgive my asking, any romantic interest in Miss Margaret Gifford? No. Why don't you ask me if I have any romantic interest in her? Well, have you? Uh, Robbie and Margaret are very attached. They have been ever since they were kids. But you, Mr. Gifford, never accompanied your brother on any of these visits. I try not to monopolize, Mark. One thing about this last dead girl that's got us foxed. Where did her boyfriend get hold of that chair that he used? to wheel her into the wrecks. Dead girl? She said that she was seen wheeling herself out of the cinema. Yes, but now we know that she didn't. Why? Because she doesn't exist. You told us that. No such disabled girl, you said. Which led us to deduce that if she wasn't disabled, she might be dead. Postmortem confirmed it. She died at about 2.30 p.m. The question remains, where did her boyfriend get hold of that wheelchair? Hospitals have wheelchairs. Airlines have wheelchairs. Quite a number of disabled people have two wheelchairs. 
both of which they're unlikely to be occupying at the same time. Do you have two wheelchairs, Mr. Gifford? I have had for months, ever since Mark bought me this new one. Then I wonder if we might borrow your old one. It's in the garage, folded beside the wall. Sergeant. But you're wrong. Wrong? A dead body in a wheelchair. The head would flop, noticeably. Yes, well, that's what we thought, too. But according to the post-mortem, her head was propped up. What with? A garden stake? No, some kind of brace. And I suppose you'd have one of those, too. Should I have? Well, the trouble with your neck lesions when you lifted that television set off. All right. So I've got a brace. Might we see it, please? In the bedroom. Second top drawer of the wardrobe. Thank you, Mr. Gifford. Anything else you'd like? A set of calipers, chest expanders, kitchen sink? Hmm? He rang his brother at exactly 5.30 by my wife's diamond watch. And the line was out of order. Now you're sure he said out of order, Mr. Lipton? Not no answer. He said out of order, sir. Of that, I'm sure. Thanks for help, Mr. Lipton. Not at all, sir. So, Robbie didn't disturb our sailor boy's sleep, not at 4.30, not at 5.30. Interesting. But insufficient. Thanks, Sergeant. Hello, can you get me the rainfall figures for Kiton yesterday afternoon? Yes, I'll hold on. Yes, the police were here all afternoon, young cousin. Trying to break down your alibi for when you murdered those girls. Me? Oh, come off it. <laughs> Don't worry, I showed them my diaries, which proved that Mark was with you. Hmm, had me worried there for a minute. Did the police tell you they were running up these yesterday? Asking about Mark? Or were they? Hmm. So you see, Mark's the one in the hot seat now. Hey, Mark? And the last four tricks are mine. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. Robbie, there's something we have to straighten out. Forget it, Meg. You'll never make a bridge play. You see, I knew that you had openers, and I knew that you would have to have clubs and spades. I had a string of diamonds and not a single club. Now, any player worth his salt would have realized what I was up to. I was out to squeeze you. That's not what I'm talking about. Margaret, could I see you for a minute? Oh, I don't think we can allow that, partner, do you? No, definitely not. No, the rules of bridge state quite categorically that a partner can table Meg, please, just this once. Can you hold off? I love you. Do you love me? Well, you've got a damn weird way of showing it. Please. I'm sorry. Look. Just until tomorrow. I promise you after that you can... You can do what you like. Mom, what's happening tomorrow? What's going on over there? If it's bridge advice you're giving her, you're wasting your breath. He's not wasting his breath, I can assure you. Well, what is there to straighten out between you and me? Seems so. Do we have to go now? Well, it's late. You right? Well, we'll see that it is soon. You haven't been around for ages. Good night, Andrew. Ciao. Mayor,
You really are a savage player, Robbie. I like to win. Because it's a gamble? Because it's a challenge. It's all I have left now, the freedom to challenge. Don't begrudge it me. Bloody hell, look at the time. Tell you what, while I'm brushing my teeth, you fix us a nightcap. Then we'll drink to tomorrow's game with Cheadle. Thank you. Cheers. To tomorrow's game. Where did you say you got this? Singapore? You should ask for your money back. It's full of sediment. Little brother, I would have preferred to have talked to you, but our relations seem to be breaking down. Are you afraid of what I might say to the police? You needn't have worried. My hatred of the police goes back as... as far as I can remember. Oh, you're too late. Do you hear? You were sneaking out while your father and me was asleep and you fell down 
the stairs. Could I see you for a moment, Mrs. Thompson? Prove it. It's up to the police to prove it. We've got more important things to do with that time. No, little brother. I'd be the last person to go to the police. I've got those details for you on Robbie. Robert Thompson is his actual name. Any good? Well, I can see why he doesn't like cops. Tell me later. Uh, is the wheelchair ready? Hello, oh, yes. Good enough? Have you got the neck brace, Hattie? Now, if we have to talk, I'll call you Iris. You call me Ted, right? Yes, sir. Yes, Ted. Yes, Ted, sir. Sorry. Ted. What are you doing here? It's about Mark. Does he know you've come to see me? No, no, he's still asleep. He's in trouble, Meg. Would you like a coffee? No, thanks. Just sit down. This is serious. And what were you two talking about last night at the bridge party? What sort of trouble? You're having an affair with him, aren't you? What exactly? But come on, I'm not asking for a ball-by-ball -ball description. I'm sorry, Robbie, I wanted to tell you. Then why didn't you? Mark didn't want you to know. Why, doesn't he think I can handle a bit of competition? It's no competition, Robbie. You're absolutely right. Mark would be a far more practical proposition than I. Robbie, it's not that. It's just... Obscene for a man in a wheelchair to have sexual feelings, yes, I know. Well, that's really below the belt. You said it. Look, I'm already late for work. If you've got anything serious to say, please say it. What did you come over here to say? Just that there's no future for you and Mark. 
Well, she could have had leprosy or a hole in the head. She could have been dead. No one would have noticed a damn thing. Robbie? Robbie, what's going on? Robbie, for God's sake, answer me! Nothing to say. Come out. Not until Cheadle arrives. That'll be too late and you know it. We've got to talk before he gets here. I'll come out. If you go down to the end of the garden. Hell for. So that you can't jump me. Go right down the garden and shout when you get there and keep shouting. But I, I can't just stand at the bottom of the garden shouting. Sing then! If I do, you'll come out and talk. I'll talk to you from the French windows. If you try and rush me, I'll slip back inside and lock them. I've got no intention of rushing you. Glad to hear that. Mark. What? Take the target with you. I'll shout when I've set it up. Do that. Target's up! The camp down ladies sing this song. Do da, do da. Camp down ladies, sing this song. Do da, do da. The camp down race track five mile long. Oh, do da day. Gonna sing all night. Gonna sing all day. I bet my money on a bobtail nag. Somebody bet on the bay. The camp down ladies, sing this song. Do da, do da. The camp down race track five mile long. Oh, do da day. All right, you can stop now. Gonna sing all night. That's enough. Gonna sing all... All right, now move aside. And whatever it is you want to say to me, say it from there. It's about Cheadle, Robbie. Just leave the running to him. You must make sure he hasn't got enough to arrest me. Oh, yeah? 
I want you to promise me. And if I do, you'll be safe. Safe may be, but pestered by coppers, Cheadle will never give up. You know that. Listen to me, Robbie. It's the best we can hope for, isn't it? Come inside. You've only shot five. The sixth I'll keep handy. Now, nice and slowly. No, no, slower than that. Come inside. We'll finish our talk in here. Now, very carefully, sit down. You'll not move an inch in any direction before there's an arrow through your heart. My neck's fine. My arm's strong, and from this range I could not miss. Now, very carefully, close those doors and sit. Steady, kiddo. Be very steady. Turn around and sit. You can turn back now. switched. While your back was turned, you could have got clean away. What are you going to do? You know. Don't be stupid, Robbie. Whatever else I may be, I am never stupid. What could be more stupid than getting yourself arrested for murdering me? This is mad, Robbie. Why murder me? I'm not going to murder you. I'm accidentally going to kill you. People sitting on the dike don't get accidentally killed with swords. Which is why when you're dead, I'll shove the sixth arrow into your chest where the sword went in and dump your body down by the target. You see, little brother, people standing in the vicinity of targets do get accidentally killed with arrows. You think the police will believe that? I will tell them how you set up a target and stood back and watched me fire five. And then, just as I let go my sixth, to my horror, I stepped right into the line of flight. Why did he do it, I will groan, and Cheadle will explain to me, no, no, Mr. Gifford, you mustn't blame yourself. You did your best to protect him, but he was a murderer, you know, and he knew that the net was closing. They've established that you were at the scene of each crime at each of the relevant times you had access here to all the props you needed for your little stunt down at the wrecks. Aren't you forgetting my alibi? 
My phone calls to you. Charlie will tell them that you didn't answer. So will the Liptons. Don't underestimate Cheetah, Ruby. I know you think I'm only saying that because I'm frightened. Aren't you? I'm terrified, actually. <laughs> Yes, kiddo, we've gone too far. There is an alternative. What? Finish this bloody thing together. Forget it, little brother, it's too late. Not quite, Robbie. How the hell did you get in? He was in the door. You always arrive at the most inconvenient times, don't you? I thought it wise. One of my men radioed through on his walkie-talkie that you were about to kill your brother. Where is this walkie-talkie man of yours? Up my chimney? Up there in the garden. Was my man mistaken? Was his man mistaken? Am I dead? You need medical attention. I'm all right. You sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. All right, let's get down to business then. Mr. Gifford, why did you go to such extraordinary lengths to dispose of Miss Talbot's body? You left her in the cellar, didn't you? Mr. Gifford. Lay off him, Inspector. You have no right asking leading questions without a warrant. Oh, I have a warrant. In that case, you should warn him that anything... Anything he says will be taken down, but it won't be used as evidence. And what the hell are you playing at? I need to understand why your brother acted as he did. And you're even dimmer than I thought. Why is that, Mr. Gifford? Because any fool, even you, would see that he did what he did because that was his trademark. I'm sorry, Mark, but I'm not telling him anything he doesn't already know. You and your bloody promises. Promises? When he's got a warrant for your arrest and I'm frightened of you. What do you expect me to do anyway? Hold him and the sergeant at bay with me, little Sabre, while you make good your escape. Yours has been a difficult role, hasn't it? Don't 
patronize me, Cheadle. No, I mean it. And you played it superbly. What do you mean? Well, all those various hints to us about your brother's guilt, for a start. You had to tell us just enough to frighten him, but not enough to let us arrest him, didn't you? I thought that if I could frighten him into not killing again, and at the same time keep him out of your hands, then I was justified. But then he started plotting to kill me. But he's devoted to you. He still wanted to kill me. Last night, he offered me a nightcap full of finibars. Oh, your brother tried to kill you. And you, when we came in just now, were about to kill him. We were always a close family. Mr. Gifford, why did you try to kill your brother? Isn't motive supposed to be your job? All right, try this for size. You committed this series of murders close to your brother's house, knowing the suspicion would fall on him. En route to your cousin's place, you bundled the first three dead girls out of your car while it was moving, under cover of darkness, in the vicinity of the police station knowing that a cripple as strong and as determined as your brother could also do that. When we failed to identify your brother as the maniac, you committed the fourth murder and disposed of the body in a manner befitting the maniac. But then you very clumsily drew our attention to yourself to convince us that you were merely an accessory, a, a devoted accessory, ridding his murderous brother of an unwanted corpse. But it was all too pat, Mr. Gibbon. I mean, why did you return to the wreck stinking of the dead girl's perfume? Why? Unless it was to lead us back here to your brother. Clever. Clever Mark. Clever Copper. You deserve each other. How much did your father leave you, Mr. Giffen? Leave me uh, about 80,000. And how much has your brother cost you so far? I mean, his house, the car, so forth. About 30,000. And how much a year do you allow your brother? 8,000. So, even if the remaining 50,000 were wisely invested, at the end of eight years, There'll be nothing left. So what? So that if you murdered your brother this leave, you'd be 50,000 better off than if you let him live. How's that for motive? Absurd. Why? Because he's only got... Exactly. I don't believe you've got a warrant. Sorry, sir. I want to confess. Ready, Sergeant? Christ! I, Mark James Gifford, of 15 Cornwall Crescent, South Yarra, being of sound mind, do hereby voluntarily confess to the murder of four girls since August last year. I also confess to the attempted murder of my brother, Robert, the evening of Thursday the... What's the date? Mark. What? Last night, when I asked you to pour me a nightcap, I wanted to die. That's what I thought. I'm sorry I didn't drink it. I wouldn't have let you. I don't want to interrupt this very personal exchange, gentlemen. 
But if we may now, Mr. Gifford, have the rest of your confession. The rest? There's still one or two details outstanding. Such as? A murder weapon. Oh. Yeah. One of Robbie's old sabers. Thank you, sir. Is that it? The warrant. Robert Stephen Gifford, I have here... But I've confessed. The murdering four girls with a sabre. Yes. But that wasn't the weapon employed. Not that we are sure what it was, but we do know it wasn't a blade. Whatever it was, we are sure that your brother used it. Indeed. As a cripple, your brother was an unlikely suspect, but not an impossible one. You, however, were. Going as far as, uh, kind of? Thanks. The P&O Company tell me that anatomy is not a subject which is taught to officers of the Merchant Marine. I don't get the relevance. Don't waste much time, do you? Only someone with a thorough knowledge of that very unnautical subject could have killed all four girls with an identical right-handed upward thrust from below the ribcage. <coughs> Your brother's right-handed, and the Melbourne Medical School told me he was brilliant at anatomy. And why would anyone so brilliant fumble his fourth murder when he'd already succeeded with the first three? Janine Talbot was killed at 2.30. Her body was still in your brother's car when you arrived. You were early and caught him by surprise. You surprised me, all right. You caught me with my pants down, literally. I wish you'd come when you say you're coming. Okay. What's wrong? You a bit frazzled or something? He knew he had to trap you this time, or not at all. He knew his neck lesions would kill him within a year. Do what you're told. Nowadays, my neck gets a bit stiff and my aim can be hairy. What would people think if I killed you? Ironical, isn't it? He told us he got them lifting a television set. In actual fact, he got them shoving dead bodies out of his car. OK, I'll put your things in the car. No! Now, I do everything for myself, Mark. You know that. Conjecture. The only body you're sure about was in my car, not his. Put there by him. <laughs> Impossible. He had plenty of time. The cars were parked close together. He could have transferred the body from his car to yours while you were phoning your cousin. After all that rain on Wednesday, the lawn was very soft. Wherever your brother moved, he left tracks. The shallower ones, where he wheeled only himself, and the deeper ones, when he wheeled an added burden of about 100 pounds. We've done tests. Janine Talbot weighed 102 pounds. Someone else could have put her in my car. Someone else in a wheelchair. Someone else with a knowledge of anatomy. Someone else who despised the police so much he incorporated in his plan a gambit to make them a laughing stock throughout the country. What gambit? Dumping the bodies outside the police station. The press loved it. You've got to admire him for it, really, though, don't you? Showed a lot of guts. And he'll get away with it. Do you want him to get away with it? That still doesn't prove him the murderer. What else would? He hated sex, remember? And in particular, young blonde of easy virtue. I'm not partial to them myself. You didn't have one for a mother. What about the blonde I picked up? Aren't you forgetting her? Anyone see you put her down? Well, yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. It was in front of the post office. I shouldn't think anyone noticed, though. I mean, people don't, do they? Oh, yes. Yeah. She came to see us yesterday. Gave us a very good description of you. So did her aunt, who was waiting outside the post office. And now, Mr. Gifford, if we can dispense with your confession. It's about Cheadle, Robbie. You must make sure he hasn't got enough to arrest me. And if I do, you'll be safe. Not until you provide me with a motive for why Robbie did it. Take your pick. He hated his mother for leaving him as a child. He hated the police for not punishing his mother. But why me? Are you suggesting that he hated me enough to frame me and kill me? This is mad, Robbie. Why murder me? I'm not going to murder you. I'm accidentally going to kill you. You came between him and his adoptive parent. <coughs> also, you came between him and the girl he loved. <coughs> One thing that Robbie couldn't stomach was the fact that you remained healthy and he became a cripple. Robbie! 
Robert Stephen Gifford. Last night, when I asked you to call me a nightcap, I wanted to die. I'm sorry I didn't drink it. I wouldn't have let you. So that was the murder weapon. Half an arrow. I suppose we should have guessed. Better ring for an ambulance, Sergeant. No point in my saying anything. When will you be charging me? Hmm? I was an accessory to Janine Talbot's murder, remember? I don't remember that. Sure, my sergeant doesn't remember it either. Who are you, sergeant? No, the only accessory we remember is the hippie at the Rex. He's vanished. Probably in Sydney by now. Might even be dead. All that heroin, amphetamines. All the same, these hippies. Well, we'll be on our way now. I'll leave a man to look after the MLS people. You won't be required again. I'd get someone to have a look at that leg. Goodbye, Mr. Gibbon. Can you come over straight away? What about Robbie? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. 